Okay. <coughs> Let's, I guess, uh, come to order. First thing, um, how did people do on the problems this week? How many people this week we were dealing with the problems in combinatorics? How many people got, was that right or was, was in combinatorics this week? Is that right? Past week. Is that right? Right. Okay. Um, how many people got four of them? Last week or this week? Last week. Last week. Now reviewing, reviewing the past. Okay. How many people got four of them? How many people got three of them? Okay. How many people got two of them? How many people got one of them? How many people got none of them? Okay, those people may not be here. Okay. So that's pretty good. Any um, other questions or uh, issues with any of the confidence or problems from last time? Actually, I had an interesting experience this weekend that this is a little relevant to what we did this past week. Is on Friday I went to, uh, there's an algorithms theory uh, seminar here. And um, Professor Yi was giving a very interesting talk about some data structures. There was some auxiliary problem and something he came up with that, um, you know, I realized could somehow be solved by using it. You get the answer that you wanted in some sense by doing a recurrence relation. And I wrote my little, you know, 10 line program to compute the recurrence relation. And I then, um, instead of solving it, went to Sloan's handbook, which I talked to you guys about. And I found that our function that we were looking for happened to be 2 thirds square root of 2. So um, trying to figure out that somehow that, that just going from a numerical example to the idea that you would really be able to figure out a function like this is really kind of an amazing thing. And that's why if you ever play around with combinatorics or numbers or anything like that, just keep that, that, that in mind. That's kind of just an amazing resource to have and it's fun to play with. Okay? Any questions? Okay, I won't go through what the recurrence was, but I somehow like the fact that somehow I can go from writing a little program to getting an answer that my function is asymptotic to this. Okay, uh, so easily. Any questions? Okay, um, to build on last, the other thing I did last class, just before we forget about it, last class, at the end of class, I passed out the, um, what do you call it, the uh, homework assignment on the uh, problem, the, the tw 100 problem read assignment. Did everybody get a copy of this last time? If you didn't, I'm going to pass around another set just for people to look around and pass this around. But I wanted to just talk about this assignment briefly. Um, it's due the last day of classes. Okay, so in one sense, you don't have to worry about it now. On the other hand, um, it's probably, you've probably also got other things due the last day of classes. So you might want to look into that. Um, what I want everybody to do in here is um, to read a large number of programming problems and get an idea of just how do you solve them. So now there's a certain skill involved in reading something, seeing whether or not it is uh, you know, something you know something about, or knowing how to pigeonhole these problems. And um, to help develop that, uh, I guess I'd like to try this 100 problem read assignment. And what you're going to have to do is um, at the end of the, you know, basically what you have to turn into me is a file, a .txt file, um, with 100 lines of text in it, one line for each problem. Will you give me the name of your number of your problem, um, a signature to whether you find it an interesting problem? So kind of a lot of these problems that you'll find on the judge, some are more interesting than others. I'm kind of interested in finding out which are the 10 or 20 of the 100 problems that you read that you think are best, okay? Best in terms of most interesting, most exciting, um, the ones that, that, that you're sitting here regretting that I'm not going to assign them in class, okay? Those are the ones that I would like to know about. And so I want you to tell me what those are. And for those, I want you to mark with a star, okay? Any questions? Um, I then want to know you know, know a little bit about the problems that you read. I'd like to know how much, how advanced the material it depends on is. Okay, certain subjects depend, certain problems depend on relatively advanced material, things an introductory programming student might not know about. Okay, let's say like parsing 
okay, or you know, compilers or context-free grammars or something like that. And certain things do rely on really nothing more than very elementary concepts, but clever, okay. So I want you to give me a level idea of, of one, two, or three, depending upon whether a year one student, year two student, or year three student would be needed to do that kind of a problem, okay. I want you next to tell me how you found that problem. Did you find it okay? Did you find it fun? Did you find it dull? What did you think about that problem in terms of how interesting it was? Um, then I want you to tell me about how well written it is. Is it badly written? Like you, you hated reading it. The problem itself might have been interesting, but you may have hated reading the write-up. I'd like to know if the write-up is good or bad. And finally, I'd like to know a little bit about how you would go about solving it, what some of the ideas were in it. So ideally, I'd like to get some kind of a description of um, what, uh, what, let's say, topic it would fall into. Is it a problem that just basically requires iterations? Is it a problem about data structures or strings or sorting or arithmetic or combinatorics or number theory? These are the ones we've done so far. Or some of the other topics which we're going to be doing. Backtracking, graphs, dynamic programming, grids, geometry, computational geometry, or something else. Um, and just some little details, very, very briefly, about what the problem might be about. There's some concept underlying it that you can pick out. Okay? Give me a couple of key words on that. Any questions about this assignment? Uh, yes? Uh, what, uh, what do you mean by other? Other means something that isn't one of the above. Okay? Other means none of the above. Okay? Can I put that other or just write something else? Well, you, you, do what, you do what you think is best. Okay? Um, I would probably say write other and then put something else after the other. If you notice the way I have it, I've got comma separated, uh, a list of comma separated terms there. So you can go back and tell me other parsing, okay? And then whatever you want, okay? In an ideal world, I would like to be able to process these at the end and let's say identify the best problems or something like that. Um, so I would like you to try to use the format that I give, which says that things should be separated by tabs. These fields should be separated by tabs. And those last things should be in commas without any white space in them. But, um, so try to adhere to that. I expect that, uh, that, that, you know, we won't have perfect adherence, but hopefully we can get, we can get some, okay? Any questions? So, so I'm not so much interested in, you know, everybody has different problems. Everybody, if you look at this thing, should be able to look at the back of the assignment and see exactly what bank of problems they have to do. Okay? In fact, I encourage you at the very least right now, to take, not now, but when you get, uh, get out of class, to take a look and make sure you see which hundred problems I have assigned to you and get a sense as to what the scale of the problem is. Okay? Any ideas? Any comments or questions? I am picturing that uh, it should take you about five minutes per problem. That is what I am hoping for. Five times a hundred is five hundred. 500 divided by 60 is a little less than 10, okay? So that's an argument that this would take about 10 hours, okay? If people behave, do it, do it the way I think they are, you know, do it at that speed. Um, now, I think people will get suicidal if they try to do all, all 100 in a 10 hour period, okay? So um, I don't want people to do that, okay? What I think I encourage you to do is to set aside probably a little time soon just to get a sense for yourself about what the scale of it is and try the first 10 problems or so and then get a sense as to how, 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 how to do this and what the rhythm is and then do this on an occasional basis. The right way to view this is 10 one hour units rather than one 10 hour unit. Any questions? Any other uh, questions or comments about uh, the assignment? Okay. So once somebody, did anybody, I assume nobody started it yet. Is there anybody who actually started it? Okay, this I don't expect. But um, I would be interested, the first person to actually try it, I'd like, I'm curious as to see how well my estimate 
of um, five minutes per problem works out for you guys. Okay, that's what it takes me. Um, it's possible that I read much faster than you. It's possible that uh, other things are happening. I'm curious, if, if this turns out to be something that is grossly out of scale, let me know. But I do think in my heart of hearts this is not that, that outrageous an assignment, although you can't do it all at once. Okay? Any questions? If you leave this for the last week, you are going to regret it just because you're going to get bored, you know, sort of an hour and a half into the assignment and not be able to pull yourself out of it. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Um, fair enough. So what I'd like to do now is we're going to talk about number theory today. Um, and uh, number theory is a particularly interesting part of mathematics that's kind of a mystical thing. You always have people, uh, people tend to make very presumptuous statements about number theory, something like this, that God created the integers and everything else is the work of man. Um, what number theory is, is how many people actually here have ever studied number theory in any in a course or in something like that? Is there anybody who's taken a number theory course? One person. Okay. Any people have a unit? Do they have units on things like number theory in some of your studies? Who has had some level of exposure to it? Yeah. Um. Okay, so, so you see it in computer science in encryption. So there's a place where it sort of sneaks into computer science, okay, and that somehow there's a famous cryptographic algorithm that's dependent upon it, okay? But um, anyway, in general, there's a lot of interesting things with number theory. And um, my favorite course I ever took when I was a student was my number theory class, okay? I went to one elementary number theory class a long, long time ago, but it was very, very interesting. Um, so number theory studies the properties of integers, and uh, usually, more specifically, the problem of divisibility, okay? And um, we use the notation, B divides A, B divides A, okay, if A is a multiple of B, okay? And so part of what we're going to do today when we talk about things like congruences and things like this, Part of understanding numbers is to recognize what the notation is. Because the notation provides a way to, to, to think about integers in a convenient manner. Okay? So when we say that B divides A, okay, that means that A is a multiple of B. Okay? Which means that A is equal to B times K for some integer K. Okay? Any questions about that? Alternately, we can say that B is a divisor of A or A is a multiple of B. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so of this definition, what do we get? The smallest divisor of every integer is 1. Okay, non-zero integer is 1. Why is it? Does 1 divide A? -A? The answer is yes, because A is going to be equal to 1 times A. Right? And I guess it's not true for 0, because if A is equal to 0, if, if um, 0 does not divide an integer, because um, if 0 divided A, then A would be equal to 0 times something, and we know 0 is equal to something. Is, is it, you know, 0 times anything is 0. Any questions? OK. So um, when we talk about the visibility, the, 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 the um, somehow stuff, the, the fundamental sort of atoms of divisibility, are things called prime numbers, okay? A prime number, okay, is an integer which is only divisible by one and itself, okay? So, um, um, okay, so uh, uh, that's prime numbers. We'll talk a little bit about how you find them or something like that. But, but somehow the fundamental theory that underlies divisibility is something called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. It states that every integer can be expressed only one way of the product of primes. Okay, a prime is an integer that can be divided only by three and by, by one in itself. Okay, what are the first prime numbers? Somebody chant with me on this. Two, three, five, what? Seven. Seven, 11, 13, 
17, uh, 19, dot, dot, dot. Okay? Um, so the claim here is that every integer, okay, can be factored. We all know that it can be factored. We know it can be factored into smaller numbers unless it's a prime number. Prime numbers can't be factored anymore. Okay? But everything else can be factored into smaller numbers until we eventually get a sequence of primes. And what is called the, prime the, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic states that every integer can be expressed only one way as the product of it. Okay? By this, in this case, what we're talking about is we ignore the order of the divide, the, 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 um, the, the factors, and we, um, you know, basically, if once we ignore the order of it, 32 can only be expressed one way, basically, as a product of five twos. Any questions about that? Now, this may seem obvious that every number can only be factored one way. But it's not quite as obvious as it seems. How many people remember complex numbers? Okay, I remember way back when there were these things called complex numbers. Complex numbers do not have this property. Okay, there's more than some complex number can be factored in, in two different ways. Okay, and so it actually is not completely trivial that this is true. But it's good because somehow once we now know that every integer can be decomposed into prime factors, <coughs> This gives us a way to talk about um, all the divisors of it, okay? And that's what we call the prime, the prime factorization is the decomposition into primes. Any questions? Okay. How do you test if an integer is prime? Okay? Let's think about this. Okay? It's something people probably know. If I want to test whether a given integer is prime, what is the right way to test that? Okay? So one possibility is you try all the prime numbers that are less than it, okay, and divide whether, you know, divide it, okay, whether, um, you know, try, try, if this number is not prime, okay, it can be factored into uh, the product of smaller primes. If we have a list of all the smaller primes, less than 53, we could conceivably test one after the other to see whether or not they divide it equally. Okay? And that would be one way to test. How would you go about doing it? What would be, if you had to write a primality tester, what would be the, um, the basic loop here? Okay? Any ideas here? Maybe I'm, not, maybe I'm saying something that's kind of simple here. But suppose, let's say, I wanted to ask you to write a program that was reasonably efficient for testing that whether a number was prime. Okay? One idea would be that you build up, you test whether every number, you want to test that n is prime. One possibility is that along the way you compute ev whether every number from 1 to n is prime. That's what you were saying somehow if you wanted to say test all the primes and see if they divide it. Implicit in that is the construction of identification of all the primes. Okay, less than that. Okay? Any questions? Any other ways that if I had to ask you to test if a number was prime, what would be the easiest way to do it? Okay? Maybe I'm asking too simple a question. Suppose I had locked you in a room and I gave you your problem was, the programming problem, the zero programming problem, was test if a number is prime. What would you do? How would your program work? Okay? Okay, so okay, you're saying that depends upon the number, how large my number is, and how many numbers I'm going to give, okay? So let's say my number, I'm giving a lot of numbers. What would you do? <coughs> okay, so you're saying that if you're going to do a lot of, um, uh, a lot of numbers, 
you would build up the table of bribes and use those. Okay? That might be reasonable. Okay? Um, how big would that table be? Okay, let's think about this. If I'm going to be building up a table of all the bribes up to uh, less than or equal to n, how big a table would that be? Okay? The issue here is a question, you know, something you need that, something you're going to keep your, your, your matrix here. We know there's going to be less than n primes. But how many primes are there less than or equal to n? Okay? This is not immediately obvious. Okay? We know there's probably greater than, less than n over 2, because you divide by all, it's only the odd numbers. In fact, there is a famous theorem that states that there are roughly x over the natural log of x primes less than or equal to x. Okay? So this tells me, what does this tell you? This is actually an interesting thing to know about. First, it would tell us that there are um, asymptotically less than a linear number of primes. Okay? L less than a linear number of primes. So you might say something in a big O t test by just testing the prime factors instead of testing all the numbers, okay? Because there is this log thing. That also means, there's another way to think about this, which is that it means that roughly one out of every log n numbers is prime. Does everybody see that? So what's interesting about this is it means that primes are not common, but they're not rare either. That's another way to think about it, okay? Is that there are, um, you know, first of all, there's a famous proof that shows that there's an infinite number of primes. Does anybody know how to show that there's an infinite number of primes? Euclid, whose name's going to come up a couple of times, once gave a proof that there are an infinite number of primes. How is that true? Assume that there is, uh, the prime number is 1 to n, and multiply all the prime number and n plus 1. Right, so the claim was here that if there wasn't an infinite number of prime numbers, you could write down the complete list of prime numbers. Okay, you were suggesting I list the prime numbers, but not give me a list of numbers. Okay? If it was finite, if there were a finite number of, of prime numbers, then there would be a complete list of m of them. If we multiply the, 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 the give me the product of the first i primes, What's interesting about this number? By definition, this number is going to be divisible by every single prime. Does everybody believe that? Now, the interesting thing is, what if I add 1 to it? Okay? If it was divisible by 1 before, now when you divide it, if it was divisible by 2 before, now there would be a remainder of 1 when you divided it by 2. There would be a remainder of 1 when you divided it by 3. If you add 1 to this number, when you divide it by any one of these <coughs> primes, okay, then there is going to be a remainder of 1. And therefore, this number cannot be divided by a prime, which means that it itself has to be a prime. Does everybody see that? So this is kind of a catchy proof, okay, that proves that there has to be an infinite number of primes. Does the product of the first several pri the first n primes plus one is that number necessarily prime? So let's now think about. It. Everybody agrees there's now an infinite number of primes. Is there, how many people agree with that? You can now tell that you know, tell their tell their friends why there's an infinite number of primes. That's good. That's educated. Now suppose we define this number. We'll call it genus of m. Suppose I took the first n primes and multiplied it and added 1 to it. Is that number necessarily prime? Why or why not? Okay, you say it's not a prime. Why is this not necessarily a prime? Because uh, maybe some uh, the number may have some factors is larger than n. 
So does everybody see that that's basically true? He's given a number, and we list all the primes. We agree there's an infinite number of primes. We take the first m of them, multiply them, and add 1. We're going to get to some point here. This is what s of m is, right? The possibility exists that one of these other primes Okay, that, 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 that goes beyond them, would in fact devise it. Okay? How big a prime do we need to test, though, if we're going to test this S sub, S sub M as prime? How big a prime number do we have to test till we're sure, as a possible divisor, till we're sure that it is in fact a prime number? Okay? Do we have to test all the primes less than S of M? So suppose we want to test that this number is prime. And we have a list of primes. Do I have to test all the primes less than or equal to that? Or is there possibly a more efficient algorithm? How many people don't understand the question? Okay. So suppose, let's say, so right now, you, you have, last we had left you, you were proposing an algorithm that best if that number is prime. Namely, to go and find all the prime factor primes less than or equal to this number, right? And see if they divide it. My question is, do we have to test all of those numbers? Okay? Or is there a point short of trying all prime factors less than this, prime numbers less than this? How far do we have to test? You say that we don't have to go beyond S sub M over 2. And why is that? Because you're saying that, that, that the smallest prime is going to be 2. Therefore, if this thing is going to be have a product, if, the, if, if this thing is not going to be prime, if our number here is going to be the product of two things, if the smallest one is going to be 2, possible 1 is 2, the largest possible 1 would be our number divided by 2. Okay, so I agree that we're not going to discover our any prime factors beyond S of M over 2. Right? But if we want to test if the number is prime, do we have to test that far? How far do we have to test? The important thing is if we consider that our number, our target, is going to be equal to A times B, what is the smallest number such that, it, <coughs> that, that, um, that the bigger of these, that, that, that the what is the biggest number, such that the smaller of these two, okay, can be? That would be the case when they were equal. And so if we test up to the square root of n, okay, our target, then we know that we will find out whether or not there was a problem. Okay? Any questions about that? Does everybody agree that we never have to look past square root n? Okay? Any questions? So if I'm to understand what is the complexity of this algorithm, how much time does it take then, if we have this table, how much time would it take to test, find, test whether an integer n was, was, uh, was a prime? Exponential. What? Exponential. Well, how much? If it's n, what is the time complexity? Square root of n. You would say it's the square root of n. And the size is, uh, the input size is uh, 2 to power. Huh? Okay, so what's interesting? It's the okay. square root of n. Log n. Okay? The square root of n, if we try all integers, okay? And we're assuming we can do a division in constant time, right? If we assume we have the table, it's a little bit better. It's square root of n log n over log n, right? Actually, wait anyway, now. What would it be, actually? Um, I think the square root n over 2 because you did not need to test. 
Uh, um, wait a second. It's, I think that's a good question. I hadn't thought about that. <coughs> what would it actually be? We know that it's going to be all integer, all the primes less than this. Okay, it's all the primes right. So it's square root n over the log of square root n. Okay? And this, of course, is really the same as the log of n. Okay, so basically this would be somewhat asymptotically faster, I guess, if um, we had the table, right? But the interesting thing is, although the algorithm is still order square root n, it is really exponential, okay? Does anybody know that when we talk about exponential, why is it exponential? The imponence is uh, the length of digits. That's because when you talk about an NP-complete problem or something like that, you talk about what the time complexity as a function of its representation. How many bits does it take to write log n, to write uh, the number n? Log n. It takes log n bits, right? So the input to describe a number is only log n bits. But you're doing square root n steps, which is exponential in the size of the input. Everybody you see that? That's why, even though it's sort of a little bit of a paradox, primality testing is square root n, and yet it is exponential. And it's a question of whether you're talking about it in the magnitude of the number or the size of the number. Any questions? OK? Any other questions about this kind of thing? I think we have a, a, a normal time algorithm to solve this. Well, so what do you actually have now? I think it's interesting, because there have been some theoretical developments here. It turns out there is now, very recently, maybe within the last four or five years, a algorithm that in polynomial time will test whether a number is prime, is, is prime or not. Okay, It won't factor the number. That's still not known to be done in polynomial time. But testing whether an integer is prime or not okay, is uh, something you can do in polynomial time. And the ways you do it, I'm not going to go into here, it's related to some randomized algorithms for primality testing. And one of your homework, one of the uh, problems that you're going to be doing this week is related to one of these primality tests. So maybe we'll talk about that then. Any questions? So you said you did some number theory when you were talking about cryptography, or somebody said they were doing it. Who, who's, talk, who's an expert on cryptography here? OK? OK? Um, did anyone know where prime numbers come in in cryptography? RSA. RSA. Has anybody ever heard of the RSA algorithm? Yes. How many people have heard of this? It's kind of an interesting thing. How many people have heard of it? How many people have not heard of it? OK, fine. It's a, it's a famous uh, public key crypto encryption algorithm, which is, interesting, which, which is interesting for a couple of reasons. But one of the things that, uh, that comes up in it, where with this phenomenon that there's only a logarithmic number of prime, that, that every log x nth number is prime in principle, <coughs> has to do with searching for keys. Okay, when, you, when you're building up a key to sort of do encryption here, you need to find a large prime number. And how can you find a large prime number? You could start by building a large random number, random integer. Let's say you want to build a random integer on 1,024 digits. That's a huge number, right? Is it going to be prime? Probably not, right? But suppose we start counting from there, OK? The next number probably isn't going to be prime. The next one probably isn't going to be prime. In general, if we start at a random large number and start counting, how many numbers, if the value that we're talking about here is n, what is the um, number of numbers we need to try until we're likely to stumble across a prime? The log of that, right? So even if you have a number that's 1,024 digits, which is a pretty big key, right? That's a number of the let's say 10 to the 1,024th. What's the log of that? You think a binary log, that's 3,000 something, right? That means that if you do this and keep counting from then on, you're only doing a relatively small number of primality tests. 
until you're likely to find a random number that is prime. Does everybody see that? So that's one of the interesting, let's say, properties of this. That's interesting. Any questions? Okay, any other questions about primes? How would you construct all the divisors of a number, though? Suppose, let's say, I now give you a, the task of finding all the divisors, all the integers that divide some number. Let's say I give you the number 24. What would be an algorithm to construct all the divisors, all the integers that divide it? OK? One possibility would have a loop that goes for i equals from 1 to n. Test if that number divides it equally. OK? And if so, just dump that out, right? But that, we agree, would be relatively inefficient, right? We instead could view it as something that's a product of all the subsets. Oh, by the way, how many prime factors can an integer have? Let's try this as a question. If I have an integer n, can somebody give me an upper bound on the number of prime factors an integer can have? At most log n. At most log n. Why is that? Because if the factors are all two. If the factors were all two, right? You would, the smallest possible prime factor would be two. Does everybody agree with that? And that, by definition, leaves me then with a number half as big. So by definition, the, the list of prime factors is actually quite small, only a logarithmic number of them, right? And usually, probably, you know, even smaller, OK? But if we want to come up with a list of divisors, okay, I hadn't thought about this. What's the max, how many divisors can an integer have? What's the integer with the maximum number of divisors? OK. Suppose, let's say, I want to know what integer has a lot of divisors. We know that the integer with the largest number of prime factors would be 2 to the n, something like that. That has a logarithmic number. I haven't thought about that. How many, what integer has the largest number of divisors? OK, and how many divisors would that have? OK. Does anyone want to propose a candidate? I think we do not log n because the maximum has an n log. Wait, the number of divisors is going to have to be greater than the number of prime factors. Well, actually, smaller. smaller. No, no, no. The number of divisors in general, this number of divisors is going to be <coughs> um, equal to the, the number of divisors is going to have to be greater than, in general, the number of prime factors. Because if I have, let's say, distinct prime factors, let's say I consider this one, 2, 3, 7, the divisors of the product of this would be 2 and 3 and 6, right? So what if there has a large number of divisors? Let's just think about this. It may be more interesting to go through the slides. OK? Every prime factor is the power is uh, 3 and 2. OK? I think it's n over log n because the maximum n over log n is prime numbers. Well, OK, certainly you want to say that, that you know that since there are n over log n prime numbers less than n. Certainly that's an argument that the number of divisors is at most n over 2 to the n minus log n. But this seems like a very gross upper bound. OK? So I don't believe that. What was your idea? I think I like your idea better. What if we add a number? How many, what are the divisors? Let's first of all suppose, let's say we take a look at it. What are the divisors of 2 to the n? What are the divisors of that? How many divisors are there? OK. It looks like in that case, there's only going to be n of them. Does everybody agree with that? What, be, what if we had 2 to the uh, n over 2, 3 to the n over 2? OK. How many divisors of this are there? Could be picking any one of these or any one of those. OK? Any subset of that, right? I think that 
the one that would have the most divisors would be the product of the first several distinct primes. Does everybody agree with this? If we say n was equal to this number Euclid had, minus 1, okay? Any subset of this thing is going to be a distinct divisor of it. Does everybody agree with that? So if we consider, let's say, S sub i, m, to be the sum of the first m primes, then basically that's going to have, basically, any subset of that. How many subsets of this are there? 2 to the m distinct divisors. Does everybody agree with that? So I think this is the one that has the most divisors. Any questions? So how do you go and find which integers, which are the divisors of an integer more rapidly? Okay? If we have the prime factorization, then any subset of those integers would be a, of, of distinct integers would be a distinct divisor. The thing you have to be careful about, of course, are that subprime factors can be multi multiple. So if you take a look at it, there are, um, what do you call it? The prime factorization of 12 is 2, 2, and 3. The number of subsets of that should be 3 to the 2 to the 3 or 8. But there are, in fact, only six divisors because two of those divisors are the same. Okay, so you've got to take care of multiplicities. Any questions about that? That's the idea of divisors. Now, the most famous divisor <coughs> is something called the greatest common divisor. What is the greatest common divisor of two integers? Okay, I'm pretty sure this, well, everybody's probably seen. Well, the algorithm for computing it turns out to be very interesting. The, the greatest common divisor of two integers is, so if we want to say, if we want to say what's the GCD of numbers x and y, it's the largest integer, okay, g, such that g divides x and g divides y. That's what we mean by the greatest common divisor. How can we find the greatest common divisor of two integers? <coughs> okay. What methods could we use? Okay. What? what? Simplest one, I guess, would be to try for the minimum, right? 4i goes from, we know the divisor has to be smaller than it. We could go, uh, deal with the, um, what you call it, uh, do exhaustive search from the smallest integer, right? But that we agree could be, would be exponential in this number of bits for the integer or linear in the size. What if I give you the prime factorization of the two integers? Suppose I tell you this is the prime factorization of x and this is the prime factorization of y. How would you find the greatest common divisor of the two integers given their prime factorizations? Intersect them, right? <clears throat> By definition, if let's say uh, k is the greatest common divisor, k has a prime factorization. By definition, if k divides this and this, both of these must be a multiple of k, meaning they must have the same prime factors in it. So certainly, if we took the inter intersection of this prime factorization, that would be a fast way to do it. Okay? Any questions about that? The trouble is that it's hard to find the prime factorization. That's actually a problem people still don't know how to solve. Okay? In, po in, in polynomial time, it probably can't be solved. Okay? It's probably a hard problem in some sense. What's the way that you find the greatest common divisor? Okay, otherwise. How many people here have seen the recursive algorithm for it? Who has never seen the recursive algorithm for it? Okay? It's an interesting algorithm that was developed by Euclid. Okay? He said, notice, that if B divides A, okay, meaning that A is a multiple of B, then the greatest common divisor of A and B is going to be B. Why is that? Rewriting it differently, 
B divides A is the same as saying that A is going to be of the form K, B times K. And at this point, it's pretty obvious that the greatest common divisor is of B times K, and B is going to be B. Okay, you can factor out the Bs. Does everybody agree with that? Okay? So the greatest common divisor, if B divides A of A and B, is B. The second part is something that I always find a little mysterious, okay? But look at it. Suppose, on the other hand, that A is not a multiple of, the, of B. Then that means that A is of the form B times T for some integer T plus a remainder R, okay? If A is not a, a perfect multiple of, of T, of B, then it can be written in this form where the remainder is not going to be zero. Okay? The recursive algorithm then states that the greatest common divisor of A and B is going to be the greatest common divisor of B and R. Okay? It makes it a recursive problem, a recursive solution, in that it starts out with two big integers, B and A and B. And it comes up with two smaller integers, okay, B and R. Why do we know that R has to be smaller than A? Because R is smaller than B, and B is smaller than A. Does everybody see that? So that's a sign that we're making progress here. But why is this correct? Okay. We know that by definition, if, we, if t is the largest, um, let's say, multiple of b that is contained less than a, by definition we can write a as b t plus r. The greatest common divisor of this is the greatest common divisor of this. If there is a divisor of, now what the greatest common divisor of, okay? it is not clearly going to be something smaller than B, okay? And it's going to have to be, because it's on this thing, it's going to have to be a divisor of B. And once we now know what is, it's really going to be what is the smallest divisor of B that divides R. And this B plus T thing, whatever one we pick, any smaller divisor of B is going to divide B times T. The thing that it has to divide to be the greatest common divisor is it has to also divide R. And so somehow this reduces the problem down to a smaller problem. And we can keep going down until we hit our basis case, which was the case where it divided perfectly. Okay? Any questions about it? So this is Euclid's algorithm. How much time does Euclid's algorithm take? Okay, let's think about this. Is this a fast or slow <coughs> algorithm? And again, we're going to have to analyze this a little bit heuristically. Suppose I ask for the greatest common divisor of n and m, where n is bigger. How many steps do we think it will take until we get down to our answer? Okay, can someone argue? Say log n. Why is it log n? Okay. What? The remainder is uh, smaller than m. Right? Because it, it the remainder is smaller than m. That by itself wouldn't really give you the argument. Because if n my m minus 1 is smaller than m also, right? So if I had a function where I was counting down by 1 each time, that would be linear and not logarithmic. Does everybody agree with that? But what is that remainder likely to be? In some sense, if that remainder is equally likely to be any integer from 1 to m, we know the remainder is going to be something between 1 and m, right? If it's equally likely to be any one of them, half the time it's going to be less than half, right? And so, in fact, usually on average it will have the number, okay? So that's a heuristic argument. That's an argument why it should take log n. 
You would need a much more careful argument to prove that that's the case in the worst case. Any questions? The worst case is also log n. The worst case is also log n, okay? But I think it's a more subtle thing to prove, okay? If you want to see that, it's in Knuth. Knuth, remember I mentioned Knuth has these books on computer programming. The, the place where I would go to see that is that there's a book he has on numerical algorithms. Okay, and, and there's a lengthy discussion in there about the analysis of this thing. Any questions? So GCD algorithm is good because you can find it in um, the, the, the common divisor in logarithmic time. But what's also interesting that, that isn't obvious at first until you study it more carefully is that the GCD algorithm will give you something else as well. In the course of dividing, finding the greatest common divisor of A and B, it will also find you integers x and y, such that A times x plus B times y is equal to the greatest common divisor. OK? And this turns out to be an interesting, a useful property for solving certain congruences, which I hope we'll get to not, you know, a little later in the class. Any questions? So this is my, my implementation of the GCD algorithm, which not only does the recurrence, but also keeps track of and computes these uh, integers x and y, which are sometimes helpful. <coughs> Any questions about that? So GCDs can be computed. The least common multiple, what's the least common multiple of two integers? OK? If I want to find the, the multiple of two integers, I can just multiply them. The product of n, n, n times m is by definition going to be a divide, divisible by n and divisible by m. But what is the smallest integer with the property that it's a multiple of n and a multiple of m? That's what we call the least common multiple. How do we find it? Okay? Any ideas how you find this thing? Okay? The union of the two prime factorizations? So one argument would be, and if we took a look at the prime factorizations of these integers, this might be P1, P1 squared, made by two P1s, no P3, two P3. The union of these, which would mean they, the two of these, the one of these, the product of those is by definition the least common multiple of them. It's got to be a divisor of this, and it's got to be a divisor of that. So the least common multiple would follow directly from um, the prime factorizations. It also follows directly from the greatest common divisor. Okay, if you have the product of these two, and you divide it by the largest thing that divides both, then what gets left, okay, is the smallest multiple of both. Okay, any questions? So Euclid also gives you that. Any questions? Okay. Another very useful tool in number theory has to do with thinking about, well, number theory is about divisibility, also about remainders. And modular arithmetic is, in some sense, a way of talking about remainders, okay, rather than you know, the, the quotients. And it turns out to be, you know, useful in lots of different things. So suppose I wanted. Does anybody who who had their birthday most recently? Who had a recent birthday? Nobody. Okay. Suppose today was your birthday. Okay, today was is Monday, uh, March 16th. Two thousand and nine. What day of the week will it fall on? In two thousand ten. Okay? How would we know this? Today it falls on a Monday. What day of the week will this fall on next year? Okay, if you want to plot this kind of thing. Okay? If you think about it, the answer is it depends upon, of course, how many days there are in a year. Right? We all know the year doesn't divide properly into seven weeks. 
okay, into seven, in, in seven day weeks. What is the remainder of 365 or 365 mod seven? What is that? Does anybody know? They write that down. What? That's one. What does that really mean? That means that if you go through a full year of weeks, and a full year there will be one day left over, right? So that's an argument that next year, at this time, it will be a Tuesday, okay? And the only difference would be if it happened to be a leap year. Because in a leap year, there would be 366 days, okay? Does everybody get that idea? So what's interesting is a lot of efficient computations on things like calendars and other things can be done by thinking in terms of modular arithmetic, okay? Any questions about that? So, what can we do with modular arithmetic, okay? Well, there is sort of an algebra on things mod some integer, okay, that we can think about. What is the remainder of x plus y when we divide it by n? That's what mod is, okay? We can simplify that to basically being the remainder of x mod n plus the remainder of y mod n with the total sum of that mod n, okay? You have to actually prove that this is true, but it's not really that hard, okay? What is interesting about this, okay? This gives us a way that if we're interested in the remainder of two numbers being added, two big numbers being added to each other, we don't really need to do big number arithmetic. Does everybody see that? We can get away taking the first number, each number, and take, work with only the remainder of it. Okay? And so one of the good things about modular arithmetic is it avoids us letting using big numbers. Okay? We can do addition in modular arithmetic. We can do subtraction in modular arithmetic. It's a little bit more subtle. What is 23 mod n 12 mod mod uh, 100 12 mod 100 minus 53 mod 100 equal to? If we subtract that, we get the number minus 41 mod 100. What does it mean when a number is minus 40 when the remainder is minus 41 mod 100? Okay, that looks a little bit funny. But if you add 100 to it, if you think about it, the set of numbers whose remainder is this. Well, let's just look at the numbers. What are the numbers that, that give us 12 mod 100? 12 would have that property, right? So would 112 and 212. Does everybody agree with that? Likewise, there's no reason why that is, that is not defined on negative numbers. Okay? Basically, this tells us that every hundredth number starting from 12 is going to be 12 mod 100. So 100 numbers before 12 should also be equivalent to that mod 100. So in fact, minus 31 is the same mod 100 is the same as 100 plus or minus 41, which is 59 mod 100. Okay, any questions? I don't think I explained that very well. But the principle should be clear. You can do addition with basically, if you're interested in only the remainder of the sum of big numbers or the difference of big numbers, you can do it only with the small numbers. Okay, and that's an interesting property. Any questions? You can also exponentiate a uh, multiplied mod n. This is maybe where playing with big numbers is even more important. If I'm interested in the remainder of x times y mod n, I can take x mod n times y mod n times the whole thing mod n. Okay? And this again will give me what the answer is without using a big number. <coughs> and the real big payoff comes with exponentiation. Okay? If I want to figure out what is x to the y mod n, okay, 
Again, what is it going to be? It's x mod n raised to the yth power. This is a small number. Could be a big number. x mod n is a small number. Raising it to the yth power is much easier than it would have been originally mod small. And what's more is, I could do this keeping it small. Okay, rather than doing this whole thing, e even if this was 2 raised to the billionth, that would seem like a large number. But because I can trim it down by mod n each step, I can actually do this arithmetic quite easily. This is another thing that comes up in the, um, what do you call it, in the RSA algorithm. When you implement the RSA algorithm, you need to do things like exponentiating things mod some power. And this is the kind of a trick that you would use to keep those numbers small. Any questions? So how do you compute what the last digit of 2 to the 100th is? Actually, why don't we do it instead, since that's on the slide. What is the last digit of 3 to the 100th? Anyone want to tell me this? OK, what's the last digit of 3 to the 100th? OK? Let's see what the first one to come up with it is. A way to think about it is 3 to the 100th is we really want, want to know what is that mod 10? You say 1. Why is it 1? It takes a circle. What? It takes a circle from 3 to 9 to 7 and back to 1. So you're saying what is 3 to the 1? 3 to the 1 is 3. 3 to the 2, what is that? That's 9. 3 to the 3, what's the last? This is all mod 10, right? What's 3 to the 3? That would be 9 times this. That would be 27. That's a 7. What is 3 to the 4? Four? 4. Let's keep going here. OK? That'd be 7 times 3. That's 21. Does everybody agree with that? And 3 to the 5, OK, is going to be what? The last digit is 3. Does everybody agree with that? So you want to say it cycles, and you're noticing this pattern, right? What would be a less clever way to do it here? OK? If I know, actually, actually if I know that 3 to the 4 is going to be equal to 1, what is 3 to the 4 times 3 to the 4 mod 10? What is that going to have to be? One. Does everybody agree with that? So we know that 3 to the 16 is going to be equal to have a last digit of 1, right? We now multiply it by, how do we get something else to multiply it by? To get it up. I guess if we multiply it by 3 to the 4, that would get me to 3 to the 64 is equal to have a last digit of 1. Does everybody agree with that? What else can I multiply it by to raise that higher? Wait, no. I think I may have done something wrong here. Three to the, OK. Well, I think I may have said something wrong here. If 3 to the 4 is equal to 1, what is 3 to the 4 times 3 to the 4? That we agree is going to be 1. What is 3 to the 4 times 3 to the 4? 3 to the 8, not 3 to the 16th, what I said, right? But it should be, what's 3 to the 8th times 3 to the 8th? That's 3 to the 16th, and that's also equal to 1, right? So we can get rid of all the products of 4. In fact, if you think about it this way, 100 is a multiple of 4. That's really the argument that you want to use, right? 100 is 3 to the 4 raised to the 25th power. Does everybody agree that that's what 3 to the 100 is? And if we know that 3 to the, this is equal to 1, 1 raised to the 25 is going to be equal to 1. So the amazing thing about modular arithmetic is it gives us a chance to make um, progress on doing certain calculations very, very quickly. Any questions about that? OK. Congruences are an alternate language for talking about modular arithmetic. Okay, and again, sometimes it's just a notation, but it's a very useful notation. 
He said, give us a way to talk about multiples in terms of equations that we can sort of work with. We say that A is congruent to B mod M if M divides A minus B. That's one way to say what this means, right? So let's go through it just one more time. A is congruent to M mod N. A is congruent to B mod M if M, the modulus, divides A minus B. If B is equal to 0, that is the same way as saying A congruent to 0 mod M is the same as saying that, 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 that A is a multiple of M. Okay? In general, this is sort of the remainder that we would get if we subtract it, if we divide it, A divided by M. Okay? And what comes out to be the fundamental problem in working with congruences is that if I give you an equation expressed as the congruences, thinking about all the integers that satisfy it, so suppose I have an expression like this. x is congruent to 3 mod 9. What integers satisfy that formula? OK? If I have an expression that says x is congruent to 3 mod 9, what is that really asking me? It's asking for what integers are there x such that 9 divides x minus 3. Can anybody give me integers of this type? What integers are there? x, such that 9 divides x minus 3. Can anyone give me an answer? Suppose me 1. 12 would have that property. What other integers have that property? 3. Does everybody agree with that? Does 9 divide 0? Okay, let's write that out just to make sure. 9 is 9. Uh, what, what, actually, how, what do we say? Is it 9 times some k? Is that possibly equal to 0? That's really what it would mean, right? What value of k would we use? 0, right? So what's interesting here is, can we generalize this to give me an equation? Okay? I claim that every integer of the form 9y plus 3 will satisfy this equation. Okay? We sort of, if you look at it this way, it now kind of makes sense. If I add 9 more to this thing, it's still going to be divisible by 9. Once it's already divisible by 9, adding 9 to it, to this thing, will still be divisible by 9. Okay? So the solution of the congruence is a formula that somehow gives you descriptions of all the integers with that property. Here we say something like, um, again, this formula here works out to be the solution is 9y plus 3. Okay? But in general, it's harder to try to solve a congruence. What are the integers that satisfy the other congruence here I list? What values of x are congruent to 3 mod 9? Okay? How would we reason this? How do we write this thing out? We really want to now know that if we talk about these integers, how do we describe it? That means that 9 divides 2x minus 3, right? That means that there exists some k, 9 times k, that is going to be equal to 2x plus 3. OK? What we're really interested here, if we solve for x, 9k minus 3 divided by 2, we want to know something about what values of x are there where this is an integer. Does everybody see that? When we're dealing with congruences, we're dealing with arithmetic on integers. And what makes solving congruences both tricky and important sometimes 
is if they were not congruent, a simple algebra would tell me what satisfied that equation, right? But it's trickier here because I have a congruence. So what values of k, k will satisfy this expression? Okay. What values of k will do this? 9 times 1, k equals 1 satisfies it, right? Does k equal 2 satisfy it? 18 to minus 15, k equals 2 doesn't satisfy it, right? Does k equal to 3 satisfy it? it turns out that, 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 that odd k will satisfy this expression, but even k won't. Okay, and the act of solving a congruence is somehow figuring out what actually does that. Any questions? When you take a number theory class, if you take one, okay, you'll spend a lot of time talking about what the properties of congruences are. Okay? Among the interesting properties, it's you can subtract congruences and add them. You can multiply congruences. But you can't really divide them, okay? And I guess if we have more time later on, as we're running out of time, I may go into that later on. The thing that, if we don't talk any more about congruences, the thing that you need to know is that there's certain classes of congruences which are easily solvable, okay? Namely, if you have a congruence of the form, A congruent to B mod A, okay? This can somehow, over, okay, this can sort of be sought, the question of whether or not finding the closed form for it falls into one of three categories. <coughs> for certain values of A, B, and N, there is no solution. For certain values, there is one solution. And for certain values, there are many solutions. Okay? And if you work through the theory, that one can sort of be solved. But I, don't, but, I, but I don't really have time to go through that now. Any questions? Okay, so that's a quick introduction to congruences and things like that. Let's look at the problems this week and see what they have to tell, what, what, what we've been talking about matters. The first problem was something called the Carmichael numbers. Okay, and it's basically asking us about... Um, a integers that satisfy the congruence. Suppose, suppose we consider a congruence here. A to the n mod n is equal to a. Okay? It turns out that if n is a prime number, okay, for any a, a to the prime number mod that prime number is a. So that's a property of prime numbers. If, this, if n is prime, this is always true. And one of the faster ideas to test if something's a prime number would be to say, hey, let's pick a random value of a. Raising a to the n is easy. We showed how you could do that if you're doing it mod a prime, mod, mod something. Okay, it's pretty fast to raise an exponent. Suppose we have a, want to test if n is a prime number. If we pick a random a between 1 and n and test if this is true, if it's not true, n can't be a prime number. If it is, a is, if this is true, then a might be a prime number. So one of the randomized tests for primes is one that does this kind of a test picking a bunch of random A's, and if all of them are satisfied, says it's probably prime. The only catch with that is that there's certain numbers that are not prime, but to always satisfy this test. And your job is to find them. Those are called Carmichael numbers. And the goal here is to find out which ones are not prime, but would satisfy the primality test. Any question? Okay. The second problem, okay, is, eh, let's just go back to this. 
The second problem basically asks, we're given n factorial. We'd like to know whether or not I give you an integer, okay, and I want to now know whether or not it divides n factorial, okay? So the input are two numbers, okay? And I want to know, does the second argument divide n factorial or not? In one sense, you could just build n factorial, like a thousand factorial here, and then test whether this divides it. What's the problem with doing that? A thousand factorial is a big number, right? So the question is, can you do this division in a way that is slicker than actually building what the number is? Okay, any questions? Um, the next one starts to get into some more interesting properties of congruences. And these may start to get to be harder. Here, I'm giving you, um, you, 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 you want to store a set of n marbles. And you can buy boxes that hold n1 marbles and boxes that hold n2 marbles. And the question really is, can you express and can you find a, a, a set of boxes to buy to hold up all, all your marbles? And if so, what the cheapest one is, okay? So it goes to break down the numbers into, into the boxes. And the final one on repackaging asks us again um, whether or not, here we are given um, packages of, okay, the last one, is kind of amusing here. It tells you that you <coughs> want to buy cups that come in, in containers where you've got a certain number of cups of size of, of the first size, a certain number of cups of the second size, a certain number of cups of the, of the third size. You'd like to find out if I can have cups that come in these kind of prepackaged sets. Okay. Let's say 417. Uh, I think I'm doing something. Okay. If cup, if you're allowed to buy packages of cups, these cups have, each package has a certain number of cups of each of three types. You would like to end up with an equal number of each type of cup. If there was a package that had an equal number of each type of cup, then you could buy it just this, and now you've got it. But in general, they're going to give you packages with different sizes. And the question is, is there some combination of, these, of, of buying from these sub-packages that will add up to an equal number of, of uh, cups? Any questions? Didn't explain that very well. But take a look at it and uh, read it, and we'll talk about it next time. Any questions? The latter two require some interesting issues with congruences. Okay, and well, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that. Any questions? Okay, thanks for your attention. I'll talk to you guys next week.